Hi everybody, welcome to Insight. In the moment we're going to be talking about music by Adez, Ravel and Mozart. But first of all, Tony is going to make us a Negroni. That's right, and we're going to do a little riff on that. We're going to use mezcal instead of gin. The original recipe I got is from my friend Andrew, who works at Sidecar, Andrew Sylvain, excellent bartender. I'm going to modify his recipe just a tiny bit because we're using a slightly different vermouth. Um, it's not as rich and it's quinine based. It's a French vermouth. So per cocktail, we're going to use one ounce of this sweet vermouth. One ounce Campari. It's important to use Campari as, an, as the aperitivo because it is a very specific kind of bitter flavor. Last but not least, one ounce Mezcal. Then we're just gonna stir that for 30 seconds. And then I'm gonna do one dash bitter directly into the glass, just kind of a little half dish. Then we're gonna strain it over fresh ice, in this case, a mass cube. There you are. Excellent. All right, cheers. Cheers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It tastes like you've used smoky whiskey in it. Yeah, it, nice little smoky flavor. So nice for the summer, but maybe a summer evening. Cheers. So, very excellent program this week. I really like the combination of three very different sound worlds and the way that they fit together. Um, let's start with Tom Addis's piece, Dawn. Um, so, this was actually a very recent composition written for very interesting reasons. Tell us a little bit about that. It was a commission from the BBC Proms for the London Symphony in the summer of 2020. And of course, that was right in the middle of COVID. So it's written for orchestra at any distance, which means that the musicians on stage can be set up far apart from each other and also can be dotted around the hall in whatever way you like to kind of create this spacious mm -hmm. antiphonal effect. Mm -hmm. um, How does he write in a way that allows it, uh, it to be spaced in that way as opposed to a piece where you really need people to be uh, you know, seated in a traditional way? Well, when you think of Adez's music, you tend to think of incredible complexity, of very um, difficult time signatures, often triplet time signatures, um, a lot of complexity. But one of the things that attracted to me about this piece is that it's not like that at all. It's incredibly simple. It's in three beats in a bar the whole way through. Um, he actually subtitles it um, Chaconi or Chacon for orchestra. And that's based on the Baroque principle of one little harmonic cell that's repeated over and over again. Mm -hmm. So it's music that seems very simple on the surface. Um, and the title tells us about what, why that is. Um, it's called Dawn, and it's a, a musical picture of Dawn as an event that happens consecutively across the globe. So if you imagine that you're watching your Apple TV screensaver and you're flying over the top of the globe and Dawn is happening continuously across the moving landscape. Yeah. That's what the music is supposed to evoke. Um, kind of a metaphor for like constant renewal and, yeah. and hope, I would imagine, during yeah. a fairly dark time for all of us. And also, funnily enough, it's his mother's name, <laughs> which huh. is kind of amusing. Um, so the music is very consonant. It's, it's pleasing to the ear. It's not dissonant. It's not complicated. Um, and you kind of get lost in the in the welter of consonant sound. It's very beautiful. Um, another reason why it appealed to me for this program is because it ends in this kind of triumphant C major, exactly the way Mother Goose ends. And I know that Tom is a huge Ravel nut, and I'm sure that there's no accident to that. Mm, that's great. Uh, and it's, it's not it's not too long, but it really it does have a sense of being out of time. I mean, I, I remember the first time I listened to a recording, it, uh, I had no idea how much time had passed from when, once it was starting to wrap up, and it's, I think that's a, a nice description of it. So, 
After that, we get to Ravel's Mother Goose. We're doing the full ballet. Um, talk a little bit about uh, this piece and what attracted you to doing this, aside from the, the key relationship on yeah. this program. Well, I love Mother Goose, and I've done the five pieces many times. Um, the history of this piece is, is interesting. First of all, Ravel wrote the five pieces for piano duet, mm -hmm. for four hands, um, in 1911. And each of those five pieces takes a title from a fairy tale. Mm -hmm. So we meet Tom Thumb, who's lost his way in the woods because the birds ate his trail of breadcrumbs that he was going to use to find his way back. We meet um, a princess of the pagodas who has very Eastern sounding music. Um, we meet the princess uh, and Beauty and the Beast who have a waltz together. And everything ends in the fairy garden, the enchanted mm -hmm. garden. So Ravel wrote the five pieces for a piano duet. Then he orchestrated those five pieces. And the five pieces that were orchestrated is what we hear all the time mm -hmm. as the piece. Then in 1912, he expanded on those five pieces and turned it into a full length ballet of about half an hour mm -hmm. by adding little interludes between the fairy tales and by creating a storyline that goes from start to finish and binds the whole thing together. This I've never done before, and we're doing it for the first time uh, this weekend. So I'm very excited about pieces that we all know really well, but pieced together in a way that we don't. Um, and also, it's going to be great just to be able to have the audience follow the story along, the narrative yeah. of the whole thing from start to finish. Yeah. Um, Ravel, of course, a master of the orchestra, brilliantly orchestrated, with great delicacy and beauty. Um, very attractive pieces. Children's music for adults, if you know what I mean. Um, fairy tales for sophisticated listeners. Um, and that balance of, of childlike innocence and incredible sophistication pretty much sums Ravel up perfectly. Um, yeah. And yeah, it ends in C major with a very similar illusion uh, that we get in the Adas as well. These it's kind of brilliant, bright, optimistic, transcendent sound. Mm -hmm. um, so I like the way that matches. And I feel like that sentiment applies very well to the Mozart concerto that we're ending the program with. Uh, the last in our series of five uh, on the David Hicks uh, uh, Mozart piano series for the, the season on our brand new Steinway. And um, of the five we've done, this is the most brimming with optimism and just unbridled joy for me. No C major, but uh, it, it's it's actually my favorite of all the Mozart piano concertos, which is saying something. I love every one we've done this season, but it's very distinctly different, like each one of these is from the rest. What 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 do you love about this one, or or what what is, is special from the other four that we've done so far this season? I always think four eight eight is the queen of the piano concertos. Five oh three is the king. Four eight eight is the queen. Um, it's a sublime piece. The allegro that begins it is a little steadier than most of Mozart's allegros. It's quite relaxed, actually. Mm -hmm. But the opening phrase, I think if Mozart had only written the opening phrase of the first movement, he would still have been the greatest composer who ever lived. Right. Um, well, I'm not going to subject you to my singing or piano playing, but come to the concert. The opening phrase is one of the most beautiful things in the world. Just the orchestra, the piano has to wait until later. Um, it's music of great beauty and grace and profundity. As usual with Mozart at his fine, it's incredibly straightforward and simple, but also with unplumbed depths. And sounds as facile as can be all, all the while. Mm -hmm. The second movement is very special. It's adagio, it's slow, it's in 6-8, in F-sharp minor. When Mozart writes in a minor key, special things happen. You think of K-466, the D minor piano concerto, mm -hmm. K-491, the C minor piano concerto, both of which we played this season already. Mm -hmm. Something very special happens when he writes in a minor key, and this is the only time he ever writes in F sharp minor, ever, in any, any movement. Um, this incredibly sad, lonely Sicilian that begins in solo piano, uh, very sad music. Mozart's not very often really deeply sad, and he doesn't very often write adagio either. Mm -hmm. Most Mozart's slow movements are actually andante, andante or yeah. andante con moto. Or, mm -hmm. So to actually have a real adagio is very special. And when the orchestra takes up this beautiful haunting melody, he writes a canon 
between the first violins and the bassoon at the interval of a seventh, which is really virtuosic, but also incredibly dissonant and... Um, Especially for that time period. Yeah, it's very soulful, beautiful yeah. music. Um, and then a finale, which is back into the world of opera buffa. Mm -hmm. um, jokes, lightning speed, brimming with optimism. Yeah. And I'm particularly happy that the pianist who's coming to play this particular piece is Simone Dinerstein, who's a fabulous Mozart and Bach yeah. pianist. Um, I first heard her a long time ago, maybe like 10 years ago, when she came to play with the Minnesota Orchestra and I was assisting, and she played Bach concerto, and she's really special. So I'm looking forward to having somebody who comes from Mozart from backwards in time yeah. instead of from in front. Yeah, that's um, an interesting way of looking at it. Yeah, so to, to, to hear how somebody who lives in the 18th century, particularly in the earlier 18th century, mm -hmm. approaches this repertoire. Yeah. Um, and it's the end. I mean, it's my favorite too. I mean, it, what is your favorite Mozart piano concerto? I mean, it's impossible. You think whatever one you're doing is your favorite. Yeah, but, um, depends on the day. This is the one I have in my license plate for my car, 488. So this is my super special favorite. Yeah. Well, very much looking forward to it. It's going to be a very special weekend. Please join us uh, in Jacoby Symphony Hall Friday or Saturday evening, 7.30 p.m. And... Uh, Looking forward to hearing you and the orchestra um, as we're getting nearer to the end of the season. Me too. Thank you very much. See you soon.